there is something to be said about about scaring like making people feel uncomfortable in a developed a highly developed country right like you know the early bikers right bikers uh used to uh always have like swastikas right yeah everyone said it's you know because they're like neo-nazis or racist which you know it's true but the thing is that a lot of there were a lot of biker uh gangs of color that also use the same imagery Mm. the same symbols right Mm -hmm. and you know hunter s thompson he wrote a book about the hell's angels and he asked them what what you know what's up with the swastikas and all the nazi imagery um and the people responded that you know we don't believe in that stuff we just do it to scare all of these middle class suburban liberals right uh we do it to frighten them under s thompson rightfully i think said if that was true if 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 they meant that they wouldn't be using swats because they would be using hammer and sickles right yeah Uh, but you know i don't know there's something to it Hmm. zizek you know the uh the marxist professor i think Mm -hmm. uh at cuny yeah Yeah. he has a bunch of pictures of like stalin in his office and he is very anti-stalinist he's a I would say he's a Trotskyist. He's like a Lacanian, um, a French Marxist almost. Yeah. Uh, but he has these pictures of Stalin just because it scares people. Yeah. It like uh, uh, evokes a sort of reaction. Okay. Yeah. That's fair. I know. Um, what was it on the Grateful Dead documentary that? Me and Nawal watched, I think you watched two episodes of it, but, or the, the documentary on Amazon, remember there's like six episodes, seven episodes, but there's one where they were talking about how, uh, what's it called, um, Jerry Garcia, that's his name, uh, where he allowed like Hell's Angels in the backstage and like into concerts and stuff, even though they caused a lot of violence while they were there, Mm -hmm. and he was saying that it's because... This is what's really profound for me. I don't know how it holds for you, but um, he basically said that like everyone that's violent in our world or everyone that's good in our world or anyone that's anything in our world is itself like a product of our society. And how is it fair to hold like Hell's Angels accountable for the conditions in which they were created, right? Yeah, definitely. The conditions in which they were, like, brought to this place. Like, he's like, uh, any nation that goes to war cannot be held, cannot, like, hold individuals accountable, right? Like, it's the whole society that's accountable. Yeah. You know? Like, we can't just hold, I mean, and it extends also to our current politics. Like, we can't hold Republicans to account for going to war in Afghanistan, right? I mean, we have to hold our entire electorate their entire democracy um, to account for the fact that these people were even in office to begin with, these, like, warmongers and these uh, profiteers. You know, and I think we should go, actually, to the book that we're covering today for this. Yeah. If you want to briefly right now. That's fair. Because one of the people he's arguing against when he's, when uh, Jackson's trying to define fascism uh, are the... um, are sort of the psychiatrists, right? Yeah. And the sort of psychology of fascism. He mentions uh, William Reich, right? Do you want to tell me what page? Do you have it with you? Let me check. I can put the page on the screen right now. Let me check. Let me check. It's also really hard to get page numbers on this scan. Is it in the fascism chapter? Uh, you know, I don't know actually. It might be before that. Uh. Oh yeah. Um. Okay, one thirty. He just briefly mentions 
Reich and That's how true. and sort of his inadequacy. 130 and on fascism. Page 130. What date is it on? Date. You know, see the date headers? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The date is... This one does not have a date. But it's right before the date, uh, 6-20-71. Okay. Oh, I see. Yeah. Yeah. Newman and Rick. Yeah. And so Reich wrote a book called uh, The Mass Psychology of Fascism, mm -hmm. which, um, which made a Freudian argument about fascism. He said fascism is caused by, you know, sexual repression uh, latent in the individual, right? Okay. Um, you know, but it doesn't, you can expand on his argument if you're going to be generous um, to make it not seem so antiquated. And I think that's what uh, Deleuze did. Deleuze would later write a book based off, uh, where he would amend uh, Reich's argument. Uh, the name of the book was uh, Anti Antiodipus, okay. right? Um, but I want to say that this that this strand of thinking, the sort of the psychological fascination, the objective fascination with uh, fascist psychology and personality is one that was really popular. I mean, it was one that was founded by Reich in the 30s. He wrote the book. And then after World War II, the UN actually commissioned a psychologist and psychiatrist to perform clinical studies on former Nazis right? To try okay. to discover their pathology, right? Yeah. The Nazi pathology. Yeah. Uh, and what they found was really surprising because the psychologists and psychiatrists all reported back that there was nothing wrong with these people, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. That what terrified them the most is that this could have been anyone. They mm -hmm. were so normal, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I think that Hannah Arendt, Arendt really expanded on that in Eichmann in Jerusalem, right? Okay. Where she pretty much argued that what causes uh, mass atrocities, um, what, what allows, enables the rise of fascism and violent fascism is sort of the banality of people, right? It's yeah. sort of people just accepting things. Mm -hmm. So I think that's where the use the value in flying swastikas or or flying isis flags comes into play is because it doesn't allow people to get comfortable right yeah it forces them to face the things that appall them and ask themselves why right what is it about these symbols that makes me feel uncomfortable and therefore you have to ask yourselves what do i stand for right yeah it's uh, making people responsible for their beliefs. Uh, that's what the symbolism gets at. Now to carry on uh, that, that that way, the pathologizing of fascism carries on to this very day. People mm -hmm. like uh, Bob uh, Altemeyer uh, and what's his name? Something Dean, they did a three, four decade long clinical research on North American political uh, personalities. Yeah. And they reached a the conclusion that 20% of North America has like right wing authoritarian personalities, right? About 20, 25% hmm. of North America. Uh, North Americans, they mean mostly Canadians and uh, the United States, Yeah. right? And I think it's a really strange way of viewing fascism that it's like it has to do with individual personalities without asking in what social structure are those personalities created right yeah what causes them and what enables them uh and this is what george jackson is getting at that it's not about individual people right 
It's yeah. not about, uh, uh, and defeating fascism isn't as easy as just killing the fascist, right? I agree, yeah. Uh, and what George Jackson talks about specifically is how Mussolini actually began as a Marxist. He was trained as a Marxist, right? Uh, and then he became the world's first fascist. Yeah. Uh, in fact, many of the early fascists were anarchists, uh, anarcho-syndicalists. They were sort of the um, intellectual Marxists who were reacting to something in capitalism, a crisis, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and it's that very crisis that fascism attends to address, right? In the same way that the revolutionary attends to address. Mm -hmm. So there is no way of getting rid of fascism, just like there is no way of getting rid of the revolutionary, right? Yeah. Uh, until the broader structural uh, contradictions which give rise to them are resolved. Yeah. Um, so I don't know. What do you think about that? Yeah, no, and I think it's interesting how you know, especially um, the way that we treat, like, mental illness in this country and how, like, basically anything that's an outlier is supposed to be brought back into the fold or right. to be put away from society. At least before the advent of a lot of, like, the most recent medications, most people were put in asylums, right? So those who just didn't... And that could be extended to people who had, like, radical ideas um, outside of the capitalist norm. And it's interesting to see, and I know we're going to talk about this at a later episode as well, but how, like, post-communist, post-anti-communist, like, rhetoric in the Cold War really pushes us towards this kind of, like, putting people in mental asylums, uh, co treating people that are outliers as, like, people who are brought up wrong or that, uh, etc. Versus, I don't know if you wanted to speak up before um, this movement, like, in the the anti-fascist but also communist like folk tradition and how it seemed to me like this wasn't maybe the fascism comes out when you try to when the let's call it like when capitalist becomes dead dogma and it just becomes the thing that is and then you punish anyone who's outside of that right and then you create people who are radicals does that make sense or is that a bad logic you repeat that so i think um it's weird like thinking something completely new off on my feet um Go for it. like when we when we look at capitalism pre cold war right uh -huh. we say that there was a lot of room for communism for marxism for radical ideas in the political culture right we had big Marxist movements, for instance. Not big, but we had a, an intelligentsia that, that, was, that had a lot of Marxist members, a lot of Marxist groups. We had the blacklist in Hollywood of all the people who were communist, right? You had the Communist Party itself. And then when you get um, this like anti-communist agenda, right? And you begin to structure and say, this is what our society is. It is around capitalism. It is around free market etc etc and then today that like leads into this kind of like proud boy alt-right agenda where it's like anyone who's not in the middle is an outlier and they need to be like pushed down with a hammer but so the reaction is to become more radical and more militant i guess i'm not sure how relevant that is so you think the re the reaction to sort of horseshoe theory Okay. Horseshoe theory was something I think Arendt, the mistake that she makes, right, is that she attempts to define fascism as a local economic geopolitical phenomenon, right? Okay. Something with rigid, uh, sort of rigid uh, criteria, right? Mm hmm. And what she defines it as, uh, and George Jackson mentions this, she defines it as uh, 
a, a state that only allows one political party, right? Yeah. And what George Jackson, I mean, it doesn't matter what he argued, but the point is that the far left and the far right are then conflated as being on the same end of the spectrum, which is horseshoe in this case, right? Okay. That both of them are, are, are essentially identical in that they both tend towards authoritarianism and that the center is the only one that can guarantee sort of liberation, right? Okay. But of course, the problem with that is I mean, I think what you're, so what you're saying is that a system which treats anything to the, to the sort of margins of the politically acceptable or normal mm -hmm. promotes radicalization. Or almost like anything that is, yeah, anything that is outside of the norm, the accepted norm, right, becomes like a mental illness. Yeah. I guess I'm trying to draw that analogy, right? Whereas I feel that before, um, and I don't know if you have more light on this, but in Europe before fascism, I feel like before the world wars, it was kind of just accepted this like monarchical rule. And then that changed into more democratic rule or republicanism. Um, but under those, under those things, like we saw the moves um, in these depressions, in these like post-war depressions towards a kind of like a more condensed norm of like this is what's acceptable in society and then anything outside of that was kind of just you know right <laughs> yeah i don't know hmm. i'm kind of going in circles to be honest i get what you mean and you know who wrote about this was a lot of uh, critical theorists, Foucault especially, and the birth of the clinic. Yeah. Sort of That's kind the of, birth yeah. of the clinic. Yeah. Uh, is sort of the and madness and civilization. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's something that is a modern phenomenon, right? Of mm -hmm. of sort of separating the mentally ill physically, right? Yeah. Uh, and sort of um, promoting a sort of normal personality, right? Mm -hmm. Where the sort of the eccentric types are seen as a, as being ill. Yeah. And they're hidden away from general population. There's something to that when it comes to political thought, I think. Mm -hmm. And it's something that George Jackson talks about. Yeah. How the black revolutionary Blackness itself is seen as revolutionary. So it has to be constantly punished. Mm -hmm. Right? It has mm -hmm. to be constantly punished. It has to be imprisoned and caged and hidden away. George Jackson was 18 years old when he was accused of stealing $70. And for stealing $70, he was given a sentence of one year to life. To life. To life. Not one to three years. One year's to life. No. And he spent 11 years in prison, most of that time in solitary confinement. He educated himself in prison and began writing to his comrades on the outside, people like Angela Davis. Uh, and that's the only way that we have his writings. Mm -hmm. And for his writings, he would be assassinated in prison, killed by a guard, right? 11 years later. Mm -hmm. So there is no, I mean, what you say, uh, how, the, how black people are treated in this country and how blackness is constantly conflated uh, with uh, revolutionary ideal, right? Uh, is evidence of that, right? That it has to be locked away, mm -hmm. right? Uh, I mean, we saw that recently in the BLM protests. The BLM protests were constantly being conflated with Marxism, right? With uh, Antifa, 
with uh, critical theory indoctrinating our students in school, right? Mm -hmm. If any of you are uh, sadistic enough to, to is Trump a fascist? I'll get to that. If any of you are sadistic enough to watch right-wing media, all of these would, uh, all of these should sound familiar to you. 